Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Tonight we have a review, and it's actually a review of one of my favorite boozy fragrances of all time. And I'll tell you what, uh, I'm doing this at night, but this is not a late night insight video. I've actually spent many a days wearing this and getting to know this fragrance. Uh, I ended up buying a full bottle because what ended up happening is I sampled the fragrance and I loved it so much it turned into a full bottle purchase. So first of all, the fragrance is called Spirit of the Glen. So this is the sample that really got me going. So thank you to whoever sent this to me. Um, and I ended up buying a bottle off my good friend Eddie. So thank you Eddie for selling me this bottle at a very fair price. Um, these are getting harder and harder to find because it is actually discontinued, unfortunately, because I think this is one of the best boozy fragrances ever created. I've actually reviewed or done videos on my channel of a couple of my favorite niche boozy fragrances. One is Amouage Overture Man, so you can go check this out if you're interested in learning about one of my favorite cognac fragrances excuse me, of all time. And the other one is, I've, I've got a comparison video actually on the channel between Roja's Creation E or Enigma Pour Own Parfum and the Parfum Cologne. So if you want to go check this video out, it's one of my older videos, but you can. You can. So there's still a lot more boozy scents I have not talked about on the channel yet. For example, I still plan on doing a review of Bentley for Men Intense. Uh, I still plan on reviewing Cherry Mugler's Amen Pure Malt. And there's a, a beautiful rum note in um, Spiritus Double Vanille by Guerlain, one of the best boozy vanillas that you can buy. Um, so I will review this one of these days as well. So more boozy reviews to come. But if you said, Ramsey, give me your top three niche boozy fragrances right now, go. It would be Overture Man, Roja's uh, Enigma, or Creation E, depending on what part of the world you're in, Pour Homme Parfum, and this little bad boy, which is from the Highlands see highlands if you will and i'll read you i'll read you a little bit about why they named it that um and again it is called spirit of the glen and I, i'm not big on packaging uh but i want to show you the packaging on this because it's absolutely beautiful and elegant and um so right here on the front this is actually the crest of glen levitt uh and the rumor is that ds and durga actually worked with uh, Glenn with Glenn Levitt to create this fragrance. So obviously this is a scotch whiskey boozy type fragrance and they actually worked with Glenn Levitt the brand to create this which is amazing. I love that sort of uh, collaboration if you will. So let me show you the packaging. So here's one side it says Highlands and it's got DS and Durga and there's actually a poem on the back. So here let me read you this poem about the um, Highlands if you will and so or the Glenn Levitt area. So and it's in, I think it's like Old English Scottish, so some of this is going to be a little uh, off kilter, but it says, O'er Highland Peak, remote Caledonia, statched in primeval forest, green mantle, where men of the raven repelled the ignoble few by the bootlegger bridge, fog, cave stills, steam plumes, the cold water flows, pristine spirit of the Glen Levitt. Barley, pineapple weed, wild chamomile, Scots pine, ages in rare woods, limousine oak, which by the way, there is a limousine oak note in this fragrance. And in, if you go to Parfumo and actually click on that note, this is the only fragrance in the entire Parfumo database that has this limousine oak note. Charred bourbon barrel, touches of sherry cask, unmistakable purity from the land of the smooth flowing one. So... There's the little poem about it. And um, so it opens up like this. So you got a sleeve and then you basically have another box right here. Opens up like this. And on the inside, you have the bottle. It sits like this and here you have a little booklet that almost turns into what looks like a map or well, it kind of unfolds like a map and you've got your note listing right here. And as you open it up, there's the little poem I, I just read you. And as you open it up further, there is a glossary of terms in here. And in this glossary of terms, there are things like Alba, ancient name for Scotland, Albion, oldest known name for the Isle of Britain, Bramble, one of the many species of blackberry, black raspberry shrubs common in the way side of the British Isles, and it goes on and on and on, right? All these definitions of things. Very, very cool. Um, and on the other side, 
is some more talk on the fragrance. And here's what it says. It says Highlands, which is what this, there's a particular like Highlands series, and I think they're all discontinued if I'm not mistaken, but I've recently done a DS and Durga video. I did a video on Amber Kiso, and I actually really like that fragrance. So I, I'd love to explore more from the house, but from what I've smelled so far, for me, my personal opinion, I think this, Spirit of the Glen, is the best DS and Durga that I've smelled so far. And it's a shame it's discontinued. This came out 10 years ago in 2013. And so here's the little blurb about the Highlands. Highlands invokes those places on our planet where the other world seems nigh. It is set in the mythical border region of early Northern European cultures, Norse, Orcadian, Scotty, uh, Celtic, Pict, Manx, and Angle. Through the very real materials, rare plant extracts, precious balsams, and other choice ingredients, we are able to access haunting memories of a faded era. The Spirit of the Glen aromatically references the surrounding countryside of the Glen Levitt, taking into account the flora, rich history, and pristine whiskey production there. So um, there are some other poems, which um, I'll just read you one. There's three others. But uh, this one's from Robert Burns. From uh, He was, uh, I guess, poet in the late 1700s. The, the braes ascend like lofty waz. The foaming steam, sorry, stream. Deep roaring faz, or hung with fragrant spreading shaws. Okay, so again, this is the late 1700s. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, but you can see some of the sort of materials that they plan on using in here. They've got the oak cask. Oh, and it also references some of the um, famous areas from Glen Levitt. P Pack Horse Bridge and Picked Fish Stone. Very cool stuff. Um, really cool little packaging. And I really like this. Um, now I'll never be able to fold it, fold it again. But I really like this little booklet that comes with it. So let's talk about the scent. So I've been wearing this as my scent of the day today, and I've really been wanting to review this for a while. I actually did a blind sniff, well, not a blind sniff, but a first impression video on DS and Durga. It's a live stream, you can go check it out. Some of the other ones I tried really didn't interest me too much. I think one of them I tried coriander, it was okay. I think I also tried one called um, cowboy grass or something, I, it was, I was also okay. But this is the one that I was really, really taken with. So. Couple from the others, a couple of the others from the brand, I thought, eh, you know, they were okay. But this one, if you go watch my reaction on that live stream, first time I smelled it, I was like, what is this? This is one of the best boozy fragrances I've basically ever smelled. And it is so, so, I mean, just, it, it, this really speaks to me as a boozy scent. So the interesting part is the opening to me, I've had a hard time sort of describing the opening, because the notes in the top are pineapple weed, which we'll talk about, scotch whiskey, pear, and grass. Those are the four notes, okay? And so to me, when when this fragrance first hits your skin for the first couple minutes, I think it smells like a fruit roll-up dipped in, in whiskey, or dipped in like scotch whiskey, okay? Uh, it is slightly earthy, it's slightly green, there's a grass note. I've read some people say that they think there's a vetiver note in here, I don't get much of a vetiver accord, personally. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Um, I think the grass note really gives it this big rolling green uh, image in my mind. Like, you're seeing, like, the way I picture, like, picturesque Scotland, right? The way an, an American who's never been to Scotland would picture Scotland. Just big rolling green hills. I used to have Scottish terriers, and I always imagined, you know, the Scottish terrier, like, sort of very coarse fur being made for that wet climate, but it's always just beautiful green rolling hills, white, right? And um, this fruit note. Now, there's actually two parts of the top that give off this fruit accord, and I think that's where that fruit roll-up like feel comes from, for me. Um, the fragrance is classified as a woody spicy, but um, the first part of the fruity aspect that in the top is what they call this pineapple weed, and it's actually in the note listing twice. So there's a pineapple weed note in the top and there's a pineapple weed note in the heart of the fragrance, okay? And so the um, pineapple weed is supposed to exude this aroma of almost like half pineapple, half chamomile. Chamomile is a very calming note. And actually, this fragrance is a very calming perfume to me. Um, 
there are certain fragrances in my collection which when I spray them just instantly give me this imagery in my head. Like I don't have to work for it. It's not something I have to sit here and think too much about. I'm just hit with this image, you know. And this is one of those fragrances where I am just absolutely taken by this image of a gentleman later in life who has lived the, the struggles of life, right? Who's seen the ups and the downs. He's got the gray hair. You know, there used to be a term for older, wiser gentlemen known as gray beards. And that gray in the beard obviously comes from experience. Um, one of my mentors, who I consider probably one of my best mentors in life, used to always tell me one main thing about experience. Ramsey, you cannot teach experience. You just have to live it. It's not something you can te teach to someone who's never lived it. Experience has to be lived. Um, and there's something to, said about, to be said about somebody who is older and who has that experience. And this fragrance just reminds me of a very well-dressed, well-manicured, you know, takes care of his appearance fellow sitting in a bar uh, and just looking like he just know, has the answer to whatever your problem is. He looks like he has, he looks, has a, like a Sigmund Freud like gentleman, you know, he's a psychiatrist or, you know, one of those folks who um, you can just sit down and talk to and he just seems to have the answer to all of your problems, right? And he's holding the uh, most expensive 50-year-old scotch, right? He knows exactly what to drink. He obviously has the money to afford it, but his taste is impeccable, right? And that's the image that I get in the top of this. And it's it's so... One of the things about this fragrance is it's so unbelievably smooth. Yes, that fruitiness is um, very likable in the top, and um, the chamomile adds this sort of relaxing vibe, but also the the setting that appears in my mind of just being in a bar and not like a nightclub, you know, not where you've got people pushing you aside to order like a well vodka and uh, cranberry juice or something like that. No, you're in a, you're in a, maybe a bar that has like a membership fee, right? Like a thousand dollars a year membership fee. It's going to keep the riffraff out, that kind of thing, right? And they have a dress code. If I tried to walk in wearing the jersey, they wouldn't let me in, right? That's the kind of place I just envision this with a really fancy, you know, leather armchair, beautiful paintings on the wall, beautiful statues, that kind of thing, right? That's the setting that I see this in. And obviously the star of the show is the Scotch whiskey. So if you take that sort of fruit roll up, dip it in the Scotch whiskey, and uh, the star of the show is the Scotch whiskey. Uh, and that's how it's marketed. You see what they're talking about. They're talking about distilleries and, and stills and whiskey and, and, you know, the land of where the, of Glen Levitt, where the whiskey is brewed and that kind of thing, right? Flowing streams, the pristine water that they use to distill the whiskey. And, um, the, or scotch, if you will, excuse me. And so what's interesting is obviously you get that boozy accord. There's no doubt about it. It's there, but, but. What sets this apart for me is the woodiness. This unbelievable, beautiful, one of the smoothest wood notes I've ever smelled in my life, ever, uh, comes through here. And, you know, if you've ever been so lucky to have tasted like a Macallan 50, or I guess I should stick with the brand actually used here. Let's say you, you've smelled something like the Glen Levitt 34-year-old or Glen Levitt 50-year-old. Um, I once had a, a friend tell me, Ramsey... Uh, I bought this, you know, aged 12-year-old scotch, but it's been sitting in my cabinet for five years. So really, it's like a 17-year-old. I was like, no, no, it doesn't work that way, dude. It actually has to sit in the oak barrel for that long because that's how it pulls the tannins and, and the actual, you know, um, the barrel itself gives the flavoring to the scotch. And he was like, oh, okay, so this isn't really like a 17. No, no, it's whatever it says on the label, that's what it is. Um, and and so what's interesting to me about this is if you've ever tasted some of those uh, high-end, you know, if you try to get like a Macallan 50-year-old, it's, it's going to run you like $50,000 a bottle, right? I mean, there are very few um, liquors that can hold up, first of all, for 50 years in, in the barrel and still be good. Uh, and also there are very few, you know, barrels they're going to set aside to be a 50 year. I mean, that's a commitment from the brand, right? So you're going to spend some serious dough on something like that. 
And if you've ever had, even just had a chance to taste, you know, sometimes they do these tastings where they'll let you have a taste of something like, of something like the very high, the highest of the high end scotches, right? And if you've ever had a chance to taste one of those, the oldest one I've ever tasted is a 34 year old. Uh, but you don't really need a 34 year old. If you've tasted like a 25 or even I think the one from reading some of the uh, early verbiage on this, since it's discontinued, it's kind of hard to find. Um, but the early verbiage on this says that um, this was actually supposed to be, um, uh, it's supposed to be sort of, you know, modeled after what they call the Glen Levitt 18, which is their um, most popular, eight, it's, it's the 18, um, they call it the Spy Side, the famous Spy Side single malt, Glen Levitt 18. That's one of their most, like, if you said, hey, what's your flagship, you know, the one that, Kind of like the, I don't know, 5 Series, the BMW flagship car, right? The Glen Levitt 18, I think, is their like flagship liqueur, right? It's not the ultra cheap one, but it's not the 34 or 50 year. But that 18 year middle of the road, I think, is the one that they're supposed to try and pull the accords and aspects out of the production of that particular one. But the reason I'm saying all this, if you've ever smelled any of those higher end scotch whiskeys, you will know that there is this unbelievable smoothness to them. You know, like if you've ever been a kid and you've tasted like your dad gives you scotch for the very first time and you taste it and you're just like, oh my God, you know, and you can just feel it burning as it goes down. You're like, why in the world would anyone drink this? The high end scotches are the exact opposite of that. Like you may be prepared for that and you taste it and you're like, wow, this is like one of the smoothest things like you've ever tasted in your life, right? Just goes down smooth the flavors, um, and you can see how somebody could almost get fanatic about it the same way we are about perfume, right? Same thing. Um, and that smoothness is portrayed here in this photorealism that I, can, I can't even describe. It's almost like you're taking the taste buds from your mouth and putting them to your nose. And obviously there is a connection between the nose and, and taste. Um, and I know... Um, you know, uh, Roja did a video when he was talking about rum, and I think he has one, Parfum de la, de la Nuit number two, which has a rum note. And I think he was talking about, you know, these connoisseurs going to a nosing room when they go do their, their tasting. They don't go to a tasting room, they go to a nosing room, is, is the word for it. Um, and so there's definitely this connection, obviously, between taste and smell. But this fragrance in particular does an un believable job of just almost like transferring that taste to your nose and and the smoothness I don't even know if I can describe it you know it is one of the smoothest most articulate um it's just unreal it's an unreal smoothness something magical occurs it feels like all of the tannins from the oak barrel have mixed with sort of this um you know, liqueur note to create something magical. And you add that fruitiness with just a little bit of green and it just really, you know, that green grass note really puts you in the mindset of just staring at the land where this Scotch whiskey is made. You know, it really takes you to the land. You can see they were talking about the architecture and some of the, you know, points along the way, a specific bridge, a specific landmark, right? This, this just makes you imagine the land. Yes, I'm imagining the, you know, uh, not elderly, but let's say experienced gentleman uh, with some with some gray in his beard at the very high end bar. But I'm also imagining the place where this Scotch whiskey is brewed. It's where where uh, where Glen Levitt hails from, right? And I don't DS and Durga just this is an absolute home run. They hit the ball, to, you know, square in the center of the bat, out of the damn park. It, it, this is a home absolute home run for me. And, um, so what's interesting is the notes from the oak barrel all seem to be accentuated as the fragrance continues to dry. So like I said, obviously the scotch is the highlight, right? The liqueur note is the selling point. But for me, it's those woody notes that really make this fragrance. I think that the woody notes are a bigger player than the scotch note itself because, um, you know, as the fragrance continues to dry, more and more of those woody notes seem to be sort of accentuated and highlighted in this fragrance. And they link up with the with that liqueur note. 
So even though to me, I think the liqueur note tends to kind of go in the background when you, when you, when you smell this and the woody note tends to kind of come to the forefront. Okay. Um, it, it just feels like they've created it in a way that's just like the holy grail photorealistic representation of smelling the oak barrel itself, you know, and I'm very curious if some of the essential oil was maybe given to DS and Durga from Glenn Levitt to create something like this. I know when Roja did his um, Creation E or, or uh, Enigma Pour Homme, he talked about how cognac leaves on the bottom of the barrels can actually form an essential oil. And um, whenever I went to Louisiana, I actually went on a, a trip within the last year. And I went to a place that actually has like a, um, they distilled their own vodka and whiskey and stuff like that, right? And the girl back there took me on a tour and she opened up one of the barrels and there was like this almost like residue coming out of the top, right? Like this gunk. And she took it with her finger. She just used her finger and scraped it off and put it on a postcard. They had like postcard, like with pictures of their, their um, vodka set up and all that stuff. And she smeared it on there and folded it and gave it to me. And I will never forget. Um, I will, I will absolutely never forget that. I think it was an old, I think if I recall correctly, I think she was telling me that they actually buy those barrels off of Jack Daniels. So Jack Daniels has like a certain amount. Um, Kentucky whiskey is made differently. And there's like only a certain amount of times those barrels can be used before Jack Daniels will not use them anymore. But they still sell them to other places who will still use those barrels, right? And that and it was an old Jack Daniels barrel that she was using. And I'll never forget, um, she gave me this postcard and, and, and that little smear that she made. Now, to be fair, um, this is much smoother, much more vanillic, and much sweeter. So there is a sweetness to this, a natural sugary sweetness that is um that was kind of missing from the actual residue that she gave me but this is the closest i've ever smelled to what i smelled on that postcard ever uh i mean it it is an unbelievably beautiful beautiful representation um spirit of the glen is just an unbelievable boozy representation for me and so what ends up happening interestingly enough is so the alcohol excuse me the alcohol, the alcohol smell just kind of um, sort of rounds and smooths everything out. It's a very rounded smell. It's a, it's a, um, it's a very rounded and very smooth, and you get all of these little hints as the fragrance continues to dry down, right? So I know I mentioned that there's the fruit notes in the top, but you get other fruit notes along the way. They mentioned raspberry or blackberry bush. Um, you get this vanillic touch obviously you get the woodiness from the oak um and you get these very malty notes right so there's like this malty hop like imagine like hops right there's like this malty slash hoppy note that comes through but it's the wood barrel note for me that is the true star of the show i know that ds and durga sold this fragrance as a scotch whiskey or or you know a um bourbon whiskey barrel like fragrance or shit, you know, there's other notes in here, but the Scotch whiskey is obviously the star of the show. But for me, it's the, it, the woody notes are actually the true star of the show. And, and as I did some research, it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, but as I was researching this fragrance, uh, they were saying that apparently something like 80% of the flavor in Scotch whiskey actually comes from the barrel maturation itself, right? So the barrel gives the whiskey 80% of its flavor and notes. And um, you get other notes in here, like there's this very yeasty cherry-like note. I think they mentioned in the, in the base there's a sherry cask note. Um, and that sherry cask note, I think, gives off this cherry, almost almondy sort of um, facet. As the hours tick by, you get a little bit of this yeasty, woody profile, slightly bacterial in nature. Um, and, you know, it makes sense because of the barley and malt or, you know, uh, think about like this Cheerio like effect. I hear that, um, you know, barley malt can give off this almost like Cheerio smell. Like you've ever just smelled Cheerios before you put the milk on, right? That sort of grainy barley malt type smell. 
and just imagine a slightly bacterial, slightly yeasty in smell. It's that, that smell starts to come through. Um, and, you know, like I said, the, um, the smoothness of the wood is, is absolutely unbelievable. There's a caramel-like aspect to it. It's like a caramel toffee woodiness that ends up coming through. That's that sweetness. So, you know, it's not like I hate every single sweet fragrance, but they have to be done properly. And here, you know, just the uh, way that everything sort of slowly blends, like, you know, what you get in the top, it's such a beautiful fragrance. Um, it's 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 really a, an absolute stunning um, al alcohol take, if you will. But um, I pulled up some of the uh, notes that, um, and some of the reasons why they actually use oak wood, which I, I never actually knew this before, but apparently one of the reasons why when you make scotch whiskey that oak wood is actually used is it's considered a pure wood, meaning that there's no resin channels. So these lack of resin channels is, is very important, apparently. So uh, it doesn't release unwanted aromas, right? Um, and so these uh, you don't want these unwanted aromas. You don't want a random all of a sudden note to show up in there that you're not expecting, right? So it allows them to sort of control the aromas that are released into, the, uh, into what they're distilling. Um, and apparently oak wood is, is very porous and it allows the barrel to breathe, which is, uh, very important and essential for apparently whiskey to go through its maturation process or whatever you want to call it. Um, and apparently oak is also very flexible and durable. So it can be used many decades, many times over. Remember I was telling you about, you know, my friend, uh, who used the old Jack Daniels barrels, right? Jack Daniels may have a, a thing saying that they won't use it except for a certain amount of times, but since oak can be used for decades, other brands can use it again and again. Uh, and they were saying that wood from oak trunks aged 80 to 200 years is ideal as a raw material for a whiskey barrel. And um, so sort of the moisture, the warmth of the sun, the drying by the wind gently matures the wood and sort of washes all of the hard tannins out. But um, um, apparently there's enough enzymes and microorganisms in there where it can sort of influence later on the, the whiskey, the aroma and how it's used and stuff like that. There's 400 different types of oak species apparently. So just think about all the different varieties, right? And I have no clue. I have no clue the type of oak that's used in here. No idea. I couldn't even tell you. Um, but what I can tell you is that if you're a fan of woody fragrances and you don't hate liqueur-like fragrances, because there's some fragrances that are very overtly liqueur, right? They have this big liquor note. Uh, it's in your face. This one, I don't think this is as in your face as some people make it out to seem. Yes, obviously you will get a little bit of that accord, but I think this really takes a turn and focuses on the barrel itself, which is a very interesting way to play it. And that's why I'm wondering if maybe uh, Glenn Levitt supplied them with, you know, some sort of, a, you know, maybe like a uh, essential oil or something. I don't know if they can get an essential oil from Scotch whiskey um, distillations, but uh, it just smells so unbelievably photorealistically spot on. Um, that it's it's just something to behold to me. And then you get all these other notes. So as the fragrance continues to dry down, to my nose, what ends up happening is that sort of malty, bacterial, yeasty bit falls away. And what ends up happening is you get more and more of this spicy, woody smell. So you almost get this like charred, they call it a charred bourbon barrel note. Um, and, you know, there is a little bit of this charred smokiness that ends up coming through. It's a very complex aroma, very complex and hard to describe actually, but just imagine sort of that, sh that sherry cask with the charred bourbon barrel. Um, and, you know, while that peaty note that you kind of got earlier falls away, you're left with this very dry, sort of woody, slightly spicy, um, and most importantly, vanillic. That's the other part. As the fragrance dries down, you get more and more of, as you get less and less of that bacterial malt note, you get more and more of this spicy, boozy, vanillic note that starts to come through. And the vanilla adds a little bit of sweetness, 
but it's so well done, unbelievably well done. So I know I mentioned sort of a boozy vanilla earlier, something like Spiritus du Blavigny. I heard somebody even mention this fragrance in regards to it, Memoirs of a Trespasser, uh, because this is a little bit of a boozy vanilla. And if you look on the notes here, you'll see there's actually an oak barrel note here. So it does make sense. Um, but actually, for, for my money, I would take Spirit of the Glen any day over uh, Memoirs of a Trespasser. Although I do think this is a good boozy, vanilla, you know, resinous-like scent. Um, I'll review that one of these days as well. But Spirit of the Glen is on another level for me. Like, if you said, Ramsey, top three niche liqueur fragrances go. Overture Man, Roja's Enigma, Creation E, and this. Um, Spirit of the Glen. So... You know, I had to kind of shove this review in late night. I've had a hard time kind of fitting everything in. My schedule's been, my life and schedule has just been absolutely insane. But I hope if you're a fan of boozy scents, you can get your nose on Spirit of the Glen. I am so over the moon to have a bottle of this. I love wearing it. Um, I, um, I sprayed a friend today, uh, and she absolutely loved it as well. And so it's just such an interesting, such an interesting fragrance. Um, very, um, very different from many of the other boozy fragrances that I've smelled. And I think that just has to do with, um, with them actually working with Glenn Levitt, the brand itself. If that's true, it's, it's unbelievable sort of advantage to them. And, and it's a shame that, um, they couldn't keep this going. The bottles look unlike any other DS and Durga bottle. So actually there's a, um, you can see the on the bottom of the cap, the DS and Durga sort of imprint. I actually really like these bottles. They just look like standard stock bottles. Um, but I'm sad they did away with this. And I think they did away with the whole line. I haven't smelled the others in the line, but I can tell you if they're anything like this, I think this is some of DS and Durga's best work. So anyways, that's my take on um, Spirit of the Glen from the Highland series from DS and Durga. What a fragrance they created here. If you have experience with uh, Spirit of the Glen, do let me know. I know it's getting harder and harder and harder to find, but if you're a liqueur lover, that this is one that gets the Ram sort of thumbs up, if you will. So anyways, hope everyone has a good evening. Thanks for watching. Cheers, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.